everyone. Um, I just, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to welcome you to um, this Gecko meeting, uh, which is hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project ECHO at the University of New Mexico. Um, these meetings are held every Wednesday. Um, we have 63 registrations as of one o'clock this afternoon from, from uh, 13 different African countries. Um, the topic today is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, limitations in treatment options uh, due to cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Um, my name is Mark Bernan and I'm, I work at um, UCT, the University of Cape Town. And uh, Professor Jonas um, is going to talk on the impact of cirrhosis and portal hypertension on the curative treatment options. Mark Sunarup is going to talk on the impact um, on systemic therapies. And then two of our fellows, Nasa Mugler and Wanga Mtunkulu are going to present um, two cases. I'm just going to share my screen um, and start with, with the introduction. Okay. Um, All good. Great, thanks. So there's, there's quite a lot in the literature about the impact of cirrhosis and and portal hypertension on 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 abdominal surgery and and non liver surgery, but actually, if you go look at it, there's not that much on on um sur on 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 liver surgery and the, and the impact on, of cirrhosis and and portal hypertension. But we know that there there have been improved survival rates in cirrhotic patients um, over the last twenty to thirty years. And that's been put down to better surgical technique and patient selection and, and be, better um, perioperative care. Um, predictors of, um, of poor outcome after any intervention um, in, a, in a cirrhotic patient depend on the, on the, on the um, degree of liver disease. And we've traditionally said that in, you should be um, hesitant to intervene on patients who are uh, child's pew grade B or C. Um, we, we, we now frequently use the, the MELT score model for end-stage liver disease score as well. Um, people talk about measuring the hepatic venous pressure gradient for, to measure the, the extent of portal hypertension, and if that's greater than 10, uh, not to intervene. The problem is that that is just not an investigation that is routine in clinical practice, certainly um, in our clinical practice, and I think in most, most centers. Um, hyperbilirubinemia um, would, would make us reluctant to, uh, certainly to do um, resections and, and refractory ascites um, is often associated with, with problems. So some of the issues of concern in these patients is the risk of liver failure after resection or intervention, uh, like I've mentioned ascites. These patients have abnormal clotting and that can they're at risk of both bleeding and thrombosis. And then hand in hand with the ascites, you are at risk of hepatorenal syndrome and renal dysfunction. And then sort of with the post, with the liver failure and, and the portal hypertension and the shunting is, is the risk of encephalopathy. I'm just gonna to touch on each of these issues and then I'll, I'm gonna hand over to Professor Jonas. So post, Hepatectomy liver failure um, has, has a number of definitions. And the odd thing about it is that almost all of the definitions only make the diagnosis about five days after surgery. So the, 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 the strange thing about that is that I, I would think that you can be in liver, you should, you could be in liver failure on day two, but according to the definitions, you, you can only make, make the diagnosis on day five, and that doesn't really make sense, but that's what, the, 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 what we stuck with at the moment. Like I've said, um, the liver function going into the intervention or the surgery um, is a major predictor for the development of, 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 of liver failure and also the extent of resection. The bigger the resection, the more likely um, the, 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 the development of liver failure. We've got very crude tests generally. The, the normal liver function tests that we use, you know, sort of don't really give a good global estimation of, of, of liver function. And there are functional tests available, such as the India Cyanine Green 
um, clearance um, that help to predict the volume of liver that you can resect. It's not also something that's widely available. We had it for a very short time on a loan basis, and it's, it's actually not that difficult to use, and I'll show you some slides on that. And then why do you, do you often get decompensation after an intervention? So, you know, especially in surgery, and if the patient's had a general anesthetic, that can impair your hepatic perfusion, and these damaged livers are already at risk of, 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 uh, uh, of worse, worse function. That these patients are at increased risk of sepsis, and that leads to worse liver function. And then associated organ dysfunction that can develop can then precipitate liver failure. So the India sign in green um, um, has been used in cirrhotic patients, mainly in, in the East, to predict um, how much liver is safe to resect in cirrhotic patients. So, so you basically inject and you see how much is cleared over 15 minutes. And um, the, 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 the less that is um, um, excreted, um, you know, it correlates with the amount of liver that you can safely resect. So this was the patient that we did. And that was one of our fellows um, uh, back in the day. And um, the, you can see we put up a drip and it works like a pulse oximeter and it measures the amount of indiocyanine that is, that, that, um, that, that is injected. And, it, and the machine automatically um, works out this curve and gives you the clearance and, and, and it's quite well validated the amount of liver that, that you can resect based on the ICG clearance. Just to go back to the definition of liver failure. So this is the one that's most widely used these days. And if you look at stuff that's published on post hepatectomy liver failure now, this is a definition. So it's the International Study Group of Liver Surgery and it's an increased INR and not or um, uh, bilirubin on or after postoperative day five. And if you go into the surgery with an elevated bilirubin or INR, it's on day five an increasing bilirubin and INR. And then, and then we can divide it into grade A, B, and C according to um, the severity. So moving on to the CITES and portal hypertension, as I've mentioned all over the literature, it says you shouldn't do any intervention if the pressure is more than 10, but it's not something that we measure. So I find that that's generally quite meaningless. The, the surrogates that, that we use are thrombocytopenia, splenomegaly, the presence of varices and venous collaterals. Um, often patients present, and you'll see this in one of the cases that we have with um, ascites and once they get onto appropriate management the ascites resolves so you know we can manage the ascites with diuretics and uh, tips if it's available patients who have ascites are at risk of wound complications wound dehiscence um, the ascites can become infected they also like i said on increased risk of uh, hepatorenal syndrome and and to avoid it we need to try and maintain their intravascular volume albumin is one of the few cases where albumin is still indicated, um, aggressive treatment of infections in the perioperative period, avoidance of uh, nephrotoxic medications, and vasoactive drugs such as terlipresin and octreotide can be used uh, to manage patients who are developing hepatorenal syndrome in the perioperative period. As I mentioned, bleeding and thrombosis um, are, are problems and, and these patients are actually at risk of both. So it's often quite difficult to know what to do. Should you be giving clotting factors? Should you be giving clexane and anticoagulants? Um, we know that, that operating in the abdomen in patients with portal hypertension carries a risk of substantial bleeding that you have to plan for and have an anesthetist that's comfortable dealing with that. You have a hyperdynamic circulation with very dilated, thin-walled, venous collaterals, um, and the, those veins have very high pressures and bleed significantly. Uh, thrombocytopenia um, contribute, can contribute to the bleeding, and then there's an imbalance, in, often an imbalance in coagulation factors. The, the other problem is that the traditional hematological investigations that we do are generally inadequate in liver disease and do not necessarily tell you what's, what, 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 what the clotting status actually is. And thromboelastography um, has been well validated 
in in um, in, in, in liver transplantation, and and it's now becoming more widely available. It's now being used in trauma settings, and the nice thing is that it gives you a real time um, indication of what the clotting is. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in that. Um, so if you look at cirrhotic patients, the bleeding issues are mainly into the GIT and associated with varices and portal hypertensive gastropathy and that sort of thing. Also, obviously, there's the bleeding issues related to surgery, but we know that these patients are also at increased risk of thrombotic events and portal vein thromboses and other thromboses are quite common. Um, there's also a risk of transfusion and over-transfusion can lead to trans transfusion-related lung injury and also result in increased portal pressures. So thromboelastography um, involves putting um, a blood into a little cup and there's, there's, a, there's, there's a little curette that spins and as the clot forms, um, it starts to turn a wire and, and, and basically there's a sensor that measures, measures the rotation um, and, and so you basically measure the dynamics of the clot um, as it forms and as, as there's lysis of the clot after it forms. And the various um, uh, measurements that you get give you an indication of what clotting factors the patient needs. Um, and I think this is quite a useful thing to have if you're going to be doing liver surgery and if you're going to be doing lots of trauma surgery. So um, I think what we know is that there's a lot of potential complications and risks associated with intervening in patients with cirrhosis and, and portal hypertension. Um, so one has to weigh the procedural risk in each case against the oncological benefit in the case of HEC. And, and I think the, 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 the risks are different for every type of um, intervention that we would consider, whether it be transplant, resection, ablation, taste, or systemic therapies. So Ed's just going to speak about um, um, the effect of um, cirrhosis and portal hypertension on, on the three curative uh, treatment options. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we'll move on to, to Professor Jonas. Thank you, Mark. I'm just going to share my screen here. I think you can see yeah, we can it. See that. Thanks, Ed. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. So I'm just going to talk um, briefly of the impact of cirrhosis and portal hypertension on, uh, on the curative treatment options, but also uh, the trans arterial therapies. Um, so as I show you there, and after that, uh, Professor Sondrup will, will talk to the, the, the influence that, that, uh, that it has on, on the systemic therapies. So if we look at the eligibility of liver resection uh, in the context of um, HCC, it's really based on a composite assessment of obviously um, the tumor factors and, and some technical issues around the operation that's very important. So we know that there are limitations in terms of the number and the size of the tumors, uh, the extent of the, dissec of the resection uh, that will also influence the expected volume of the future liver remnant. And we know that the future liver remnant should be in the region of about 25% for a, a healthy liver. Uh, and you have to compensate for that with an increase uh, based on the degree of liver dysfunction in patients with abnormal uh, liver, liver function as we get in, in, in cirrhosis. Um, so liver function, um, portal hypertension performance status, and patient comorbidities, comorbidities are also... Um, regarded and, and um, considered. Just important to point out that those are not sort of separate entities. If you have a patient with a bad or a poor liver function, the patient is very likely to have a poor performance status as well. And we know that some of the patient comorbidities may impact on the, um, on, 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 for instance, regeneration uh, in patients that you, that you have to get after a liver resection. Uh, to compensate for, 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 for the tissue, uh, the liver tissue lost. So there are a number of um, international guidelines, 
both sort of um, a regional uh, or, or um, almost continent based. And I think I show you the, the three most important ones. So we very heavily relying on the Barcelona criteria that I'll come to shortly. But it's important to point out that the Barcelona criteria are really only integrated into the ESL and the AASLD, uh, the American guidelines. And when it comes to the Asian consensus uh, guidelines and the Japanese guidelines, that they don't really consider that. This was the, um, the 2012 version of the um, Barcelona criteria. And we know it's dividing the patients into five stages. So very early, um, early, intermediate, advanced, and terminal. And there you can see at the top also um, the tumor based um, sort of criteria. And just below that, child, the, the, the liver function and child pew scores, unfortunately. Uh, at this stage, still um, probably the best tools uh, in general, though there, is, uh, there are some advances on more accurate methods for, for assessment of liver function. So very well preserved liver function uh, is needed. And they also uh, mentioned that one, one should look at portal, um, portal um, hypertension based on a gradient when you measure the gradient between the hepatic vein and the portal system something that is really almost never done uh, diagnostic. They do it when they do TIPS. Uh, so really quite a meaningless criterion if, you, if we don't perform it. And then also another surrogate platelet counts um, lower than 100,000, that would be an indication of, of the degree of portal hypertension. So just to summarize it for um, stage A, uh, zero, so very early stage, um, patients need to be uh, in a child pure A category for um, a, B, and C in a child A to B, and then uh, in the D stage, obviously it's not it's not relevant. But there has been an update or revised um, ESL EORTC guidelines um, that uh, that in, in included or incorporated sort of a modified Barcelona criterion. And you can see the big difference there is uh, in the in all the categories uh, from very early stage to advanced stage. But they've done away with a B and they uh, say patients will have to have preserved liver function. And there you see the definition of that, that they have to be child A, child PUA without any ascites. And then uh, also importantly, and that is sometimes unclear, that in patients undergoing um, liver transplantation, this is irrelevant because you, change, you, you, you give the patient a new liver, hopefully with, with a normal function. And then they also mentioned that the multidisciplinary in these guidelines that was published in 2018, that the multidisciplinary approach is needed. Decisions should ideally be based on MDT decisions and patients should be, uh, these are just conservative guidelines for the best possible outcomes, but patients should be, um, should be assessed individually to see if there's some of the factors that would not be um, relevant or weighted differently in the individual cases. Again, here, just a summary, and you can see now from early, a very early stage to advanced stage, all these patients, according to the guidelines, should be in a child view A category. We know there's a lot of treatment going on outside of these guidelines. This uh, was an article published in 2014 that um, looked at series that were published after 2005 where surgery was performed um, outside of the guidelines. And you can see at the top there in patients with portal hypertension in the five series that were, um, that were cited here, that the five-year survival was around 50%, but it's not so bad if you, um, if you look at survival, if these patients were not operated, that would probably be very close to, uh, to zero. This is quite a nice algorithm from, uh, from the 2018 your um, easel um, guidelines that very nicely demonstrate the problem. So this algorithm, algorithm is for patients with cirrhosis that you can see that if there's no portal hypertension uh, and you divide the, the, the resections into minor resections, so um, less than three segments, in other words, up to two and then three and more segments would be a major liver resection. And if you're minor, they go look at the MELT score and if the MELT score is lower than nine, the patients are regarded as low risk. So quite a low risk of, um, of, uh, of, of a liver decompensation and quite a low mortality. But when you come to um, the major resections, you're in the intermediate risk, 
with about a 30% risk of liver decompensation and a mortality of nine. And this group obviously here, the way we don't want to operate, and that would be patients in the presence of cirrhosis, cirrhotic patients in the presence of, of portal hypertension, uh, where we do a major liver resection, uh, we can't operate on a, on a, on a liver rate mortality of 25%. Um, this is a guideline published already many years ago. Mark mentioned um, ICG clearance by Makuchi, uh, one of the, the great Japanese liver surgeons, where they actually, uh, in patients with, uh, with, um, with retention, sort of, uh, first they looked at the, at the, at the serum bilirubin, and then they uh, kind of based the decisions on that. But in patients with a reasonable low retention, they looked at the percentage um, of, 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 uh, of retention. And according to that, they could dichotomize uh, into which liver resections patients are, uh, are likely to tolerate. And I'm not quite sure why we, we don't more often use this algorithm um, that uh, it's maybe a, a question of, of um, validation in, in greater series. And we also, uh, in Cape Town, we don't have ICG clearance. Um, when it comes to liver transplantation, liver function, as I said, and uh, portal hypertension, they don't play an important role because we change the liver. So the, the non-tumor um, considerations there would be performance status. If a patient you know, is just too weak for an operation, uh, then uh, that would be in contraindication. But otherwise, the extension of, the, of, of, of operating or transplanting beyond the Barcelona criteria was really just the number and size of the tumors. This is a very nice concept to, to demonstrate it, where you can see here the most conservative um, guidelines, uh, Milan criteria result in, a, in, in five year survival rates of over 70%. And the further you go out uh, from that in terms of the number of tumors and also the size of the tumors, you see the worse um, your results are. So the further you go out, the more you're gonna pay, be paying in terms of bad, um, of, of poor survival. Um, for local ablation, again, um, the main uh, issue here is the size and the number of the lesions, uh, but there's also limitations in terms of uh, patients having to be child pew score A, and they have to have a very low performance status. Um, we kind of ignore that child pew A, we would even um, ablate patients low in the low B, um, category. So that is what's happening outside um, of the criteria. And then even embolization, you can see there again, according to uh, the Barcelona criteria, you have to be a child pew score A. But if we see what's going on in, in practice uh, with embolization, there's a lot of, 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 uh, of, of transplantation, oh, sorry, of, of um, embolization going on outside the criteria. We've got absolute contraindications. Certainly we wouldn't um, do uh, a taste on patients uh, with a child pew score of eight or higher because they've got a very high risk of going into liver failure. But you can see here, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of the dogmas have been challenged in extending the criteria. Um, this is a recent article that is published from, um, from um, Taiwan that I think very clearly demonstrates the, how a treatment outside of the, the criteria can benefit patients. So here you, I'm just gonna put the, um, the algorithm for you there. You can see here patients with a very early um, HCC. Uh, the solid line is patients treated within um, the, 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 the algorithm for very early. And the dotted line that you see there are patients that have been uh, migrated um, downwards, in other words, to the treatment for early stage, um, for early stage disease. And the reason for that is that some of these patients that should have been resected or maybe um, ablated went over into uh, the, the, the early stage category where even transplant is an option. And what you can sort of conclude from that is whether you operate these patients, whether you ablate them and whether you transplant them. Uh, and this is a series from one of their big hospitals that the outcomes are the same. But it does change if you now look at early, so stage A disease, again, the, the solid line there, patient, patients that are treated um, within that category. But if you um, migrate downwards, in other words, to and you treat them as an intermediate stage, you can see here that the survival is significantly worse. Now, if you come to the um, intermediate stage, stage B, and you migrate upwards, in other words, you start treating them as an early stage, 
you can see a significantly better survival there. But if you treat them as an advanced stage, that the, the, the results are very bad. Uh, if we come to the advanced stage here and see the solid uh, line there and we treat them as intermediate stage, in other words, B, you can see that there's a significant improved survival. Whereas if they go to the terminal stage um, disease, you treat them as such that they will also have the same survival. And this I think is, is one that is particularly striking in patients that were falling in the um, terminal stage disease. In other words, where best supportive care is the only treatment available if they were moved there was a stage, a stage migration upwards in other words where they were treated as an intermediate maybe an advanced stage that there was not a large number of patients but a significantly better survival if these patients uh, were treated with some life prolonging um, therapies uh, so that's all from my side um, now thank you very much and it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Mark Sondrup, one of the hepatologists at, um, at uh, UCT uh, that will talk to, uh, on, on the impact of, of um, underlying liver disease on systemic therapies. I'm just gonna stop sharing here. Yeah, thanks very much and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologize for my voice. I've just got a bit of a cold. Um, Professor Jonas gave me a brief to say, be brief, and that's exactly what I'm going to be this afternoon. Uh, but just really look at some aspects of systemic therapies and really where they sort of nuzzle their way in, in terms of therapies uh, for HCC and uh, the impact of, of, of cirrhosis. Um, just to remind ourselves, of course, that the reality is that the vast majority of patients with HCC in fact, are probably going to have cirrhosis. It's the antecedent factor in the majority of HCCs, uh, not, of course, excluding the fact that, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, with the high prevalence of chronic hepatitis B virus infection, we do have this phenomenon of de novo HCC occurring in patients sans cirrhosis. But if, even in a subsection of those patients, they're going to have advanced fibrosis um, and um, um, even cirrhosis. So, of course, uh, the pathogenesis is driven by ongoing inflammation, uh, the development of advancing fibrosis and cirrhosis, and then, of course, which is really a pre malignant condition. Um, Professor Jonas has touched on this, and it's, of course, the uh, updated BCLC, which is what most of us, in fact, use. Why I'm putting this up is just what I've highlighted is really where systemic therapies find themselves in the BCLC. And it is really within sort of BCLC C, uh, therapy. And then just to really focus down on the fact that the vast majority of patients at this BCLCC stage are child's pu A or maybe early B. They have got relatively well preserved performance status. And even in, in the earlier stage and throughout, we talk about uh, child's pu A or early B uh, to access those particular, um, those particular therapies. For advanced BCLCD therapy, of course, we're looking at child's PUC and uh, uh, worsening performance status, and hence there we're looking at best supportive care. I thought it apt just to remind us a bit about the child's turquoise PU score, because we do use it so extensively in assessing patients for therapies with ATC. And just by way of reminder, of course, it was initially um, uh, put forward by um, uh, a child's child. In fact, died in about 1991. He was a well-known surgeon and was working in, at that point with Turkett at the University of Michigan. And their original paper was in 64 in a textbook where they proposed this staging system. And they really were looking at it from the perspective of survival surgically in patients with liver disease. Uh, and later on, uh, it was modified in 72 by Pew and colleagues. And that's where the child's Pew school come from. Of course, it's child, not child, and we all sort of uh, we all sort of use the term childs. And please, let's not forget poor Turkut because he gets left off it always. Um, but the reality is that uh, Pew modified it um, because he was uh, somebody doing quite a lot of work uh, with the portal hypertension and, and esophageal varices, and he in fact replaced the nutritional status with the INR. And in fact, was the person responsible for adding the values of one to three. And that's how we come up with the child, uh, child to score. Uh, just for an interesting historical note, 
the paper, in fact, that uh, Pew put out, in fact, the final author, in fact, was the great Roger Williams or Professor Sir Roger Williams, who died just two years ago. Uh, so just a reminder that the child Pew score uh, is divided into the class ABC. And just to put forward that, this is from uh, a paper a couple of years ago, looking at all the causes of cirrhosis and child's abuse cause, and you can kind of see what the one and two year survival is. Uh, and not surprisingly, therefore, that in patients with child's C disease, uh, who really would fall into BCLCD, uh, the survival is really driven by the poor survival of their liver disease. So key in assessing patients with, uh, for HEC treatment, of course, is the child Pew score, as has been mentioned. And then you assess the presence of portal hypertension, particularly uh, within the setting of if they have varices or not. And this is an important assessment in assessing patients for therapy. And I'm gonna get back to the varices issue within the, con uh, the context of current systemic therapies. Unsurprisingly, if you just step back from everything, somebody with a better child Pew score of course, an HCC has a far better overall survival than with a more advanced child Pew score. Again, reflecting the underlying liver disease as an important driver of prognosis. Systemic therapies have come a very long way, as everybody would know. We've really got first line therapies now, I've highlighted in blue, and then a whole lot of salvage therapies. And I'm really not going to go into these extensively, but I want to highlight maybe a few aspects of the therapies in blue. And I think the first is that we know the, uh, the tyrosine kinase or multi-kinase inhibitors uh, really have led the way in systemic therapies, the original being serafinib and the trial that has put serafinib with the more uh, the newer uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, lenvatinib, showed lenvatinib to be non-inferior. And I'm not showing you the data because of that. I'm showing you that in the trial, they included patients who were child PUA and were BCLC stage B or C. And the results, of course, were non-inferior. So to really qualify for these systemic therapies, you need to have quite well compensated but irresectable HCC. I'm just going to mention one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, which really has found its way as a solid, as a salvage therapy, mostly. And nivolumab I'm mentioning because it's one of the first therapies, a salvage therapy, where really the trial, in fact, included patients with more advanced disease. So they included child PUB. Um, and in fact, the overall response rate was about 30%, with a median uh, duration of response of about 17 months. So this is the, one of the newer therapies, a salvage therapy really in patients who fail first-line therapy, where they, uh, in the trial, in fact, did include patients with more advanced disease, but in fact curtailed it with quite well or early child PUB patients. The therapy of the moment, of course, is the uh, really the key first-line systemic therapy, uh, and that is the combination of the immune checkpoint inhibitor, atezolizumab with bevacizumab, which is a VEGF inhibitor, the, you know, the data now quite clear, again, a head-to-head -head study uh, against serafinib. And again, I'm not going into the details, but showing who was included in the trial, again, well-compensated child PUA and good performance status patients. Now, importantly, and this is what I mentioned earlier, I'm coming back to, is patients were excluded with untreated or incompletely treated varices with bleeding or high risk for bleeding. An important issue, because if we just look at the data, we see that in this head to head study, and the reason why it's become the therapy of first choice as first line therapy, atezobev was, was superior to serafinib in the trial. But let's just look at the actual precautions, and I'm not going to focus on them all. But bevacizumab, the VEGF inhibitor, is really associated with GI perforations and seems to put patients at quite a high risk of variceal bleeding. And if you look at the actual trial data, just look at the atezobev arm versus the serafinib arm. And yeah, we actually saw eight bleeds uh, in the, in the atezobev arm versus only one uh, or, or three, at least in the, in, the, in the serafinib arm. So an important aspect of evaluating patients for this therapy is understanding that those with significant portal hypertension, varices, in fact, need to have variceal control or not have varices at high risk <clears throat> to actually qualify for this therapy. So just to finish, if we look at these guidelines, you can see that across all the board, whether you're using any of these therapies, and I haven't gone into them all in them detail, patients have to be child PUA, and it really is only nivolumab, which of late has entered the fray as to suggesting that more advanced disease 
could qualify and benefit from the volume app. And just to finish off, this is a nice little picture, which is the ESMO guidance, where they've taken the BCLC and they've put in all the various systemic therapies. And again, just to underpin the fact that no matter what systemic therapy you're using, the if firstly, uh, it is for patients with more well-preserved um, um, chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, good child abuse score, and of course, to evaluate for varices and those with more advanced portal hypertension clearly are a greater risk. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, it was an interesting thanks, talk. Um, the, the next um, the next speaker <coughs> is going to be uh, Dr. Ntumkulu, who's going to present a case. So while while he's sharing his screen, there was just one question for for Professor Jonas, and that was from Wisdom and Dumbi to everyone. Said, um, sorry, I just uh, just get that question up. Um, it says um, the guidelines are on portal hypertension decisions for liver section, do they apply to HCC plus query cirrhosis plus query periportal fibrosis from schistosomiasis? I see patients with schistosomiasis and also HCC in the area I work from, but difficult to assess the cause of cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ed, I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, so so if it just a semiasis, I mean, we must realize that it's a it's a it's a it's a prehepatic uh, problem, and and that the 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 the, the uh, portal pressure in the liver is actually not that high. Uh, so so I think in terms of the, the morbidity, we've had patients like that that we've dissected. They're a little bit uh, easier to work with than patients uh, with with a sort of a hepatic with a cirrhosis associated portal hypertension. And I think the, the 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 morbidity and the mortality is a little bit lower, so uh, so a bit less difficult. I mean, I would think you know the chance of you getting post hepatectomy liver failure is less, but the complications are related to ascites like wound complications and those sort of things would be a problem if the ascites was poorly controlled. Um, yeah, but obviously the liver function is almost normal or normal. Yeah. So, so you don't have the limitations in terms of uh, of cirrhosis in addition to the portal hypertension. I mean, sorry, I, see, Mark, no, sorry, 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 yeah, uh, no, sorry. I just wanted to mention that certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, we must remember that the, you know, that 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 cert, certainly North Africa, the commonest association with with schisto is Hep C, and then other parts is Hep B. So even though the schisto may be there, one still has to get a sense of whether there's a cofactor, and if so, you're still going to have to assess the fibrosis in the liver as well, because it's difficult to tell the difference. But if it's schisto alone, Ed, I, you know, I agree with you completely correctly. It's, it shouldn't influence things. Wisdom, does that answer your question? Yeah, my, my question was to say, like what uh, Mark has just said, if there is something like Hep C or Hep B with a periportal fibrosis from schisto, the liver resection guidelines, will they still just go ahead in that same algorithm? Because I'm assuming if there's periportal fibrosis in addition to a cirrhosis, which you cannot identify the cause, but you're suspecting it could be hepatitis B, is, is it still okay in terms of the algorithm? That's what I wanted to find out. I mean, what we've done sometimes in these patients before doing the resection is, 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 you know, if you've got hep B and, 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 and schisto is to do a biopsy and see how bad the, the, the fibrosis is. And then obviously, you know, if the patient's got poor, then, then a lot of the time the guidelines then revert back to what the child pew score is. So, you know, if they were child pew A and there was not much fibrosis, you could almost treat it like, I would think a non serotic liver. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Wanga? Hi, I'm Dr. Mtin Kulo. I'm going to present a case um, um, that we saw. Uh, it's a 67 year old male uh, who's retired, uh, good social circumstances. Uh, he presented uh, initially with a life threatening varicell bleed uh, that was uh, managed endoscopically. Uh, this was the first time that he presented. Uh, he had no prior history of uh, any liver disease. 
he was hepatitis B core antibodies and surface antigen negative and also hep C negative. He's got a significant ethanol history and he is also overweight. Um, he also has coronary, coronary artery disease, um, but he was deemed fit by cardiology review. Um, um, at that time, he was encephalopathic with ascites. Uh, the score, uh, male score was 19 with a child poo of 11, I gave him a B. Um, um, so that's, these are just his blood results when he presented. We screened him for um, also for HCC at that stage. Uh, his alpha fetoprotein was 10. Um, he was managed medically uh, and his condition improved uh, quite significantly. Uh, we also did a CT scan for him uh, at that index presentation, which essentially just shows uh, ascites and also features of uh, liver cirrhosis with the uh, atrophic hypertrophic uh, complex with the coded lobe uh, hypertrophy. Uh, but on this uh, imaging, even though I don't have all the sequences here, but he didn't have any uh, features of uh, HCC on, on, on that scan. So we put him on the surveillance program and uh, on subsequent follow-up, um, he came back with uh, increasing alpha fetoprotein of 112. His MELT score had improved to nine and his child P score um, um, had improved to A. We gave him six points. Um, so we proceeded to do a CT scan to try and screen him, uh, in fact, to search uh, for uh, HCC. At the time we managed to obtain the CT scan, his alpha fetoprotein had already increased to 4,000. Um, and uh, these are just the images of uh, his CT scan. Um, I'm just gonna show um, a bit of the arterial phase first. Um, um, you can appreciate uh, the features of cirrhosis. And on this scan, there's improvement in the ascites that uh, we had seen. If you look very close to the um, segment uh, three, there's an area of hypodensity there. There is a very minimal arterial uptake um, and uh, if we go to the portovenous phase um, um, if you look at into the portovenous phase you can see there's uh, that area does wash out uh, quite significantly mm -hmm. and um, the concern with this uh, tumor was the fact that it was very close to the um, to the to the to that portal vein, and uh, of course, at that stage, the liver volume was not allowing for us to proceed with uh, with the with the perhaps uh, a, a major liver resection. So we opted to do a taste for 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 the patient. Um, he had taste, and uh, um, and we repeated it three times. I mean, sorry, twice. About three months later. Um, he had a very good improvement. Um, his alpha fetoprotein dropped to 38. Uh, we also repeated imaging. On his imaging, there wasn't much of a change. Essentially, the, 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 the scans uh, remained as, as, as what I've, I've already previously shown you. But the patient's uh, general condition improved and he had stopped drinking. Um, so we opted to, to go uh, do a, a, a resection. We used uh, ultrasound interoperatively. That's what his liver looked like. Um, and of course, with that kind of liver, there was a lot of bleeding intraoperatively, um, um, but patient did um, um, well uh, day one postoperatively. Um, just as a progress uh, postoperatively, patient became encephalopathic, uh, developed ascites, uh, and he went on to, to develop uh, post-operative liver failure. Um, we string him along with IV fluids. We gave him uh, lactulose. Uh, at some point, he GCS dropped to nine, um, but um, miraculously, he improved back. He's uh, awake and responsive uh, currently. Uh, just in terms of his histology, um, uh, it came back as a, as, um, as a, as a potassium carcinoma. And we had clear margins, about three millimeter um, 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 uh, from the from the resection margin. So we had a pathological T one A um, with clear clear margins. That's the end of the case. Thanks, Swanga. So good presentation. Um, so.
it, I mean, I think this case illustrated some of the difficulties. Um, so just with regards to the, the encephalopathy, um, you know, initially he was he was really fine. And on about the day three or day four, his ammonia jumped up and his GCS dropped to the and to the point that he was developing focal neurology. And we had to give him um, mannitol um, as there was a concern that he was phoning. We started him on high dose lactulose and rifaximin. And he, he, by the next morning, his condition had improved substantially. Um, and he, he was, you know, his GCS was 14 out of, out of 15. Um, the encephalopathy happened despite his bilirubin ribbon and his INR being um, quite, quite um, well, well maintained. And, and, and his renal function hasn't been too much of a problem, even though the ascites has got worse. So he's now day 10 after surgery and, and much better. Um, but it was quite hair raising in the beginning, and that was after quite a minor, um, minor resection. Mark, so if I may just comment, I think it's a very interesting um, patient because if you if you go now to the strict guidelines of this patient from the start, wouldn't have been a candidate for for TACE um, due to due to his child Q score, and and uh, certainly not for surgery either. And uh, if you just look at the outcome of the taste, um, just looking at the, at the alpha fetal protein, it was actually a good outcome. Now it's early days about uh, after the, the liver resection, but so far it looks good. But I can just recall uh, one or two patients where we've done exactly the same thing. You, you sort of try to get rid of their risk factors, specifically alcohol, and then you improve their liver function and the ascites goes away. And then we perform a minor resection but I've seen some of these patients at six months after the resection, they, they clean of cancer, but then they start deteriorating again. And the question is, and I don't know if Mark wants to weigh in on that, if, if you sort of down stage a patient uh, in terms of the child pew or, or get them to a, a lower score, is that sustainable or is that sort of just sort of in hospital, very uh, intense uh, intervention that sort of temporarily uh, get them there, and then they they bound to 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 get worse again later. <clears throat> I mean, it, it depends on on the underlying etiology, I, I guess. Um, you know, patients with viral hepatitis. If you treat that, they tend to stabilize out very nicely. And if they go back to sort of a child pew A, then their prognosis, if they remain HCC free, is actually pretty good. I think in the setting of patients with NAFLD and or or, or or alcohol associated liver disease that may be somewhat different and i think with nash that is where there's a real problem if one's not addressing aggressively that those underlying metabolic factors you're not really dialing down the actual uh insult um and 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 you may well still then have background progression of disease i mean alcohol perhaps is a little bit easier in that uh, if you're actually abstinent your prognosis should be reasonably stable. But I think NASH is the unknown entity because it depends how much you dial back on the disease. And I've suddenly just realized you were speaking to me and not Mark with a C. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't get asked the difficult questions. <laughs> no, sometimes you are, Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, in, in my reading last night, I came across one article that said, you know, like often you do get these patients better, but there was a feeling that maybe the patient that came in like this guy, child P pew B, and you operate on him. So when we operated him was child pew A, but he had been a B, that they often perioperatively decompensate more than someone who was never a B and always an A. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's true, but I mean, certainly this guy went back to having his ascites and he was encephalopathic when he had the bleed and he's got encephalopathy again now, but yeah. All right, um, if there, are there any other comments? I, I don't see any, if anyone has, they can they feel free to just um, put up their hand or, or comment in the chat group. Otherwise, I think we'll move on um, to the next case, Dr. Mugler is going to present a case um, um, and we're just going to discuss it. Thank you, Mark. So, so just a quick 
um, a presentation of one of the patients that we saw um, <clears throat> in our unit in the last three, four days. Um, so, and maybe just we have a discussion around the case. So this gentleman, he's 45 year old, a farmer, um, married with three children, uh, with a, um, a positive smoking history, has a 10 pack year smoking history, and he is, um, has also got uh, alcohol uh, use history. There is no um, family history of, uh, uh, of notice. Uh, he previously um, had no any comorbidity, but he's a newly diagnosed with hepatitis uh, B. Um, his actual presentation this time, he was presented to one of the secondary level hospitals with uh, 10 days history of right upper quadrant pain and jaundice uh, associated with nausea and vomiting. And he also reported significant weight loss of about 10 kilos over the last two months. So generally, he looked um, well, mid-age male with clinical signs of jaundice, no signs of anemia or lymphadenopathy, and no evidence was with, uh, of uh, encephalopathy. Uh, his uh, focal abdominal examination um, notes just soft abdomen, not distended, no organomegaly, and he has positive shifting dullness uh, in, uh, uh, in the abdominal exam. His performance score was one, and his childhood score of uh, uh, nine, it's B and a uh, male score of 11. His bloods, as you can see on the screen, uh, his bilirubin was a little bit elevated, uh, bilirubin of uh, 60 uh, total and conjugate of 29, uh, elevated ductal enzymes, and he has hepatitis B positive, uh, both surface antigen and core antibody positive. His um, alpha fetoprotein was 15,825, and he had a CT scan uh, done by us, uh, which I'm just gonna go through now. Starting with the arterial phase. You can already um, see there is ascites uh, and atrophic uh, liver, uh, mainly and the left hemiliver, segment two, three, and uh, also segment four. And you can uh, notice that the surface of, uh, of the liver is irregular, indicating um, the liver cirrhosis uh, with some evidence of uh, portal hypertension based on anasitis and the splenomegaly. His abdomen is a little bit distended. And you can um, notice that in segment two, three, here in this area extending to segment four, there is a mass with, um, with increased enha enhancement in this arterial phase. I'm gonna move to the portovenous phase. This is the portovenous phase. Just in the same in the same region, you can see notice there's a clear wash out of contrast in the portovenous phase. I didn't upload the delayed phase, but it also shows that there is a wash out of um, of the contrast from from the lesion. So this is um, LIRAD five, and it is a diagnostic of uh, HCC with with the increased alpha fetoprotein of more than uh, 15,000. And of notice also, if you, um, if you look at the portal uh, vein, it just, it disappears going to the, to the uh, left portal vein. So there is a left portal vein thrombosis in the, um, in the left side. And again, you can see the ascites more obvious in the pelvis. So this is the case, it was discussed on the MDT. Um, and we would like maybe to stimulate the discussion again and just think of what's um, the options and what's the next step of the patient and Mark can leave the discussion. 
Thanks, thanks, Nasser. So I don't think I was at that MDT, but um, just a few things. Sorry, the, the, the only risk factor is alcohol. Is that right? Uh, hepatitis yeah. B and alcohol. Okay, okay, okay. No, just because I just thought you know the alcohol issue that you mentioned wasn't that significant. So, yeah. um, I mean, obviously, that one of the concerning factors from an oncological perspective is is the very high um, alpha feta protein. Um, and now you've got a patient with um, with cirrhosis and not the best liver function. So, so I would be very reluctant to to operate on this guy for oncological reasons and and the reasons that we've mentioned. But I think, you know, I know that taste would be out of the guidelines that that Ed showed, but I, I, we often do taste in this situation, and I find that that it's quite well tolerated. And it often gives you an idea of 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 of, of the tumor biology, and and you can taste more than once. And you know you might find that you treat the hip B, treat the treat the ascites, and you've got a child pu A patient with undetectable viral load and a low alpha feta protein in th in three or four months time. Um, and then we might might start I don't know we might start considering other options. Now, what do you think, Ed? Uh, yeah, Mark, no, I agree. <clears throat> so this patient, um, certainly uh, oncologically, we would, we, would, we would not operate on this patient. He's, he's got tumor invasion of the vein. Um, but, but um, yeah, you know, again, we, we're talking about possible taste in this, in this patient. If you look at the, 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 the survival that is achieved with, with taste, and I suppose that is sort of the, in, in, or it is in the, in the best case scenarios where, um, where, where it's done within the within the, the uh, Barcelona criteria, it, it's a prolonged survival somewhere around 20, 22 months. It's almost two years. And and in, in a patient like this, even if you achieve ten months, um, it, it is still it, it's it's still more than you would have achieved with uh, with systemic therapy that we in any case don't have access to. Just another point, you know, we and I've in my mind I've always thought that if if there's um, portal vein infiltration by the tumor that that may be resistant to um, to to um, to taste because I assume like maybe the portal a little bit of portal vein flow that there is is going to nourish the tumor but you must remember that that these tumors are actually nourished from re revascularization and that's only arterial so I don't know if there's data on that but I, I think if, if you do a taste for instance in this case and you take down the right um, the, the left hepatic artery um, that supplies the, the, the area around the, the, the vertical part of the portal vein where the tumor infiltration is that the effect is also going to be uh, on, the, on, on, on the tumor in the, the, the thrombus in the, in the vessel. It would be interesting to look at that. I don't know if it's been done, but, but I think this is a patient where we probably will push for taste. So, Ed, you know, just, just thinking about it, the one thing is this guy's left side of the liver is, a, is already atrophic, um, which is different to the previous case where the left side was, was, the, was the largest side of the liver. And, and, and that's because the left portal vein is gone. And I'm not saying that a resection is going to be something that's possible, but you know, if he had a really good response to taste and his liver function did improve, I mean, it would be something we could consider. I mean, we'd be very worried about it, but this is exactly the case where you worry about, you know, is he going to get liver failure? Is the site he's going to get worse? Is he going to do to decompensate? And, you know, we've had some guys who've had really good responses to taste, and you have other patients who you do the taste, and three months later, there's tumor all over the liver, and the alpha feta protein has gone to 100,000. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits of taste is that it does allow you to to select out the better patients. Mark, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, Mark, I just wanted to ask. I mean, Ed, we've had this discussion before. Uh, what are your sort of thoughts on the prevailing evidence, which is fairly early and a bit skimpy? I mean, we look at all these therapies uh, for patients such as these as sequential therapies. We look at taste and that doesn't, you know, then we go on to the next thing. I mean, the sort of idea of combining systemic therapy with uh, transarterial therapy. What are your thoughts on the provisional sort of evidence 
suggesting some potential benefit where we instead of the sort of sequential approach yeah well mark i, I can go first i i think it's, it's definitely something like you said the evidence is not very strong but conceptually i, I mean i think it, it makes sense not only not only systemic therapies and 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 uh, local treatment uh, modalities but for instance the combination of of local ablation and taste i think is also very promising because if you think where they fail um local ablation fails on the periphery where your 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 ablation area doesn't cover um the 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 um the the, the tumor and and um when it comes to trans arterial therapies it's often sort of the poorly vascularized a little bit necrotic deprived areas that is that don't respond well if it's well vascularized we know it works better and that tends to be a little bit more central in the in, in the tumor. So maybe that overlapping is going to make it a very, very good combination. And, and if, as, as long, you mean, if, if we do it at the same time, it's just going to be a, a, um, a question of, of, you've mentioned um, the newer regimes that the, the double treatment for systemic therapy, that there's a higher risk of patients bleeding from their portal hypertension. As long as the, 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 the side effects or the possible side effects or complications put together doesn't put the patient in a category where it's too dangerous to do it. I think conceptually it's 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 very inviting, but we will have to look very carefully that we don't sort of disadvantage these patients uh, with a combined higher risk for even death uh, and and serious um, adverse events if we put it together rather than sequential. Um, yeah, Mark, I mean, I think, you know, if you look at other cancers, we, we do that all the time. Um, mm. you know, and I'm sure that it will probably change. I actually just saw an article from China where they looked at giving taste and either immunotherapy or what, you know, or tyrosine kinase inhibitors or one of these newer things. And and um, the, the incidence of uh, the one thing was the incidence of liver abscesses after the taste seemed to be higher. But um, they didn't really it wasn't really big enough to see if there was a um, survival benefit thank you um are there any other questions or comments um otherwise uh, we've we've come to the end of our time um so if there's no more comments i'm just going to say thanks to to all the speakers and uh, thanks to echo uh, university of new mexico and the echo india team um, there is a feedback form available in the chat and the, the recordings are available on the um, uh, Gastro Foundation website. Um, we'd like to say thank you to the Gastro Foundation and, and to the sponsors. And just a reminder that next week's uh, Gecko Radiology meeting, and you can see um, uh, the advert on, on the screen. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.